Hello, and welcome to Red Boxing 101, how campaigns and super PACs openly undermine democracy. I'm Brendan Quinn, Senior Communications Manager for Campaign Finance and Ethics at Campaign Legal Center. Thank you for joining us. CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process. We believe our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Our democracy works best when elected officials answer their constituents and not wealthy special interests. Super PACs are permitted to raise and spend unlimited amounts on elections from a variety of sources, but only if they do so independently. They are prohibited from coordinating with campaigns on their messaging. When a campaign engages in the practice known as red boxing, they are openly flouting this ban. When a candidate can direct the activities of a super PAC that is able to raise amounts far exceeding the candidate's contribution limits and funds from sources a candidate cannot access, the risk for corruption is clear. This coordination facilitates a pay-to-play political culture where super PAC donors and operatives can trade dollars for favors and access in order to rig the political system in their favor. CLC and partners all across the country and at all levels of government have been observing instances of red boxing and finding ways to address this growing problem. Today, our experts will discuss what red boxing is, how to spot it, and what can be done to prevent it. Now I would like to turn it over to our moderator for today, CLC Legal Counsel for State and Local Campaign Finance, Aaron McKean, to introduce the members of today's panel. Thanks so much, Brendan. I think uh, if you had asked me a few years ago what red boxing was, I probably would have thought that it, we were going to be renting DVDs from a big red kiosk outside a grocery store. Um, but today, we're not here to talk about the demise of big DVD rental. Uh, instead, we're here to talk about the rise of big money spending in elections and how that evades important campaign finance laws. So to facilitate our discussion today, uh, there are a few house housekeeping items. Uh, during the conversation, you should feel free to use the comments section on Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're watching this uh, and submit your questions for members of our panel today. Uh, at the end of the panel, we'll start to go through a question and answer session and we'll do our best to get to each question, but in the interest of time, we may not be able to get to every question. Uh, and if we're not able to answer your question today uh, and you're a member of the press, Feel free to email your questions to media at campaignlegal.org. And if you're a member of the public and we're not able to answer your question today, feel free to email info at campaignlegal.org. Uh, with that housekeeping out of the way, let's step into our red boxing ring where we can meet our panelists. Uh, the first today, uh, I'd like to introduce Saurav Ghosh. He's our director of federal campaign finance reform at CLC where he leads CLC's efforts to uncover campaign finance violations and file complaints seeking administrative enforcement. He also leads efforts to pursue legislative and, and regulatory reforms to strengthen and ensure the consistent and robust enforcement of federal campaign finance laws. Next, I'd like to welcome Jordana Greenwald, Acting General Counsel for Philadelphia's Board of Ethics. Jordana's responsibilities include advising the board and interpreting laws within the board's jurisdiction through formal advisory opinions, informal guidance, and promulgation of regulations. She's actively involved in the board's training and education programs, communication strategy, and open data initiatives. And you may have seen recently, one of those open data initiatives uh, includes the Philly Board of Ethics creating an online campaign finance dashboard to make city campaign finance information more accessible to the public. Prior to joining the board, Jordana was also a trial lawyer, a trial attorney with the US Department of Labor. And finally, I'd like to welcome John Marion, who is the director, or the, I'm sorry, the executive director at Common Cause Rhode Island. His responsibilities include serving as the organization's primary legislative advocate and spokesperson in Rhode Island. John has led successful legislative campaigns across a variety of pro-democracy issues, including reforming Rhode Island's campaign finance disclosure laws, amending the Rhode Island Constitution to restore the State Ethics Commission's jurisdiction over the State General Assembly, 
and requiring risk-limiting post-election audits, among other items. Uh, thank you to the members of the panel for joining us today uh, for what I'm sure is going to be an excellent conversation. Uh, and I'd like to jump right in just by doing a little table setting. Uh, we'll start with Sarab just to give us uh, kind of a view of what red boxing is. Uh, can you, if, how do we spot it? Where do we even look for it? Thanks, Aaron. And thanks, everyone, for joining this great event. So to dive right in, I, I think the easiest way to think about red boxing is that it's a type of coordination, usually between a campaign and a super PAC. Uh, it's coordination happening in broad daylight. It is essentially a, a series of visual cues or signal words, usually both, that are used by a campaign to provide instructions to outside spending groups, usually super PACs funded with uh, unlimited amounts of money from corporations and other special interests. Uh, and these red boxing the itself come characteristic red box that's placed around uh, the section, usually on a campaign's website, that isn't really intended for the general public's consumption, but is actually providing specific instructions for a very specific audience. And that is the, the operatives of uh, allied super PACs who are going to know to go to the campaign's website and look for the red box, the signal words, um, so that they know uh, what they want them to ask about. So a typical example, just to provide some uh, to meat on the bone, is the the red box will have the words "voters need to know," "know," or "voters need to see," or most uh, peculiar sounding of all, "voters need to see on the go," uh, which is not a statement anybody uses in in everyday. <laughs> common speak. Uh, but these are words that send specific instructions to the super PAC. Uh, and, and the instructions can, can be as detailed as the campaign wants them to be. Uh, some instructions will provide specific media channels that the campaign wants the super PAC to use, like radio or TV or streaming, uh, digital apps. Uh, they will also provide instructions about what demographics the campaign should be focusing on uh, uh, that the campaign wants the super PAC to focus on. So they'll say, you know, voters over 50 who are white or Latino uh, need to know or and see on the go. And so that's, that's even more specific. Uh, and it's usually based on whatever the campaign has found would be more, more effective. Uh, and, and another example of an instruction would be the geographic targeting. So if you're talking about a Senate race, in my home state of Missouri, a red box instruction might say, uh, men over 50 in the Kansas City area need to know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, women under 50 in St. Louis need to see on the go. Uh, so these are really tailored instructions using coded language that ordinary people aren't are gonna either not know what that means or just think it kind of weird and move on. Uh, but super PACs who are reading that know exactly what it means and understand exactly what's being asked of them, which is to create ads using this enormous pool of money that they have access to that, that campaigns generally do not, and uh, use, use that money to make ads that fit the parameters of the campaign's instructions in the red box. So I'll stop there and, and uh, let Aaron ask another great question. Well, I just want to uh, stick on one point uh, quickly, just to make sure we kind of have an understanding of how this works, uh, because I want to be clear about what red boxing is and maybe what it isn't. Uh, I think what you're talking about, Sarav, is these code these code words, uh, and they'll include things like biographical information. Is that right? So you might have things that talk about details about the candidate, but it's then framed with these code words as opposed to just sort of a regular biography. Is that right? Right, that's exactly right. So in a, the typical place you'll find a red box, I should have mentioned that, uh, is on the campaign's own website. So it'll be a page on the candidate's website that is usually marked media or, or is somehow set apart, uh, or it can even be a portion of a page. 
And uh, it, it's not like the rest of the website in most cases. So we're not talking about general biographical information or even uh, policy positions or, or the campaign uh, goals for, for if the person is elected to office, what they hope to accomplish, things like that. It's usually something a little more targeted, like uh, in, in the kinds of examples I was giving a moment ago, you know, voters over 50 in the Philadelphia area need to see on the go that Saurav Ghosh has been endorsed by the Planned Parenthood and, and the uh, National Resource Defense Council. Uh, and so it'll be something very specific like that, that the campaign has done their research and knows will resonate, that, that endorsement will resonate with that particular segment of the, uh, the voting bloc that the campaign hopes to reach. Uh, and then the super PAC knows that if they convey that particular message, it'll help the candidate the most. Great. Would it be helpful to bring up an example? I think we have a couple examples available, and maybe we could talk through those. Uh, so, is Sarah, right. do you want to start with this one? Sure, sure. So, this is an example from a New York Times article, uh, which talked about red boxing and. Uh, this was a candidate in Oregon who was essentially doing doing sort of the classic red boxing here. There's the literal red box uh, that is the visual cue for super PACs. And then if you look at the text, it says voters in Bend and Portland. So using the, the geographic cues about where the message needs to be disseminated. Uh, they need to see and likely Democratic primary voters across the fifth district need to read and see on the go. So, so pay attention here to the more general instruction that all voters in Bend and Portland need to see. Uh, and then the, the more specific instruction that likely Democratic primary voters in the district need to read and see on the go. See on the go being uh, a very peculiar uh, signal instruction for uh, digital and, and mobile uh, type of uh, advertising. And then the actual message that they want conveyed, that Kurt Schrader, the, the candidate uh, whose website this appeared on, shares the progressive values, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so the super PAC knows how and where to spend its money on ads, and it knows what needs to be in those ads. And then uh, actually, just as I was saying, like the, the groups that Mr. Schrader wants, you know, the super PAC's ads uh, highlighting, like Planned Parenthood and uh, various other organizations. Uh, so he's he's specifically re requesting that these organizations uh, be mentioned or highlighted in these ads so that uh, the voters he's trying to reach are going to be aware of the specific endorsements that he has. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks for that, Sarav. I think, you know, one of the things about red boxing and why we're talking about it today is that it's such a live issue, right? It's happening right now and it's an issue that is happening you know at all levels of government and i think it'd be a great time to turn to to john uh because uh, he and i are both familiar with uh an issue that came up in the fall in the most recent general election in rhode island yeah thank you and thanks to clc for putting this uh together today and and for your partnership uh, with my organization over over years working on uh, some of these thorny issues. So yeah, we have an example from Rhode Island um, that hopefully they can uh, put on the screen for us. Uh, and this was actually for the uh, Democratic gubernatorial primary in Rhode Island. Uh, it was a four-way primary. Uh, one of the candidates was our incumbent Secretary of State, uh, Nellie Gorbea. And this is uh, taken from the Wayback Machine because the, the website's no longer live. Uh, this was her uh, website, a page from her website, about three weeks before our, our September primary, um, so right before early voting began. And uh, I just want to point out a couple of things here. Uh, this is a, uh, a single page on her website that was under the media tab. Um, and uh, while you can't see the whole page here, you can see on the right and left side, it was in a red box. There were no other pages on the website uh, that were literally physically had a red box around them, um, just this one page. Uh, and I want to point out that first line. Uh, when it comes to Rhode Island, 
when it comes to the Rhode Island governor's race, voters need to see on broadcast, cable, and OTT that Nellie Gorbea has been an advocate for abortion rights her entire life. And I just want to pick on that term OTT. Um, I had never heard this term um, until an enterprising reporter named Ted Nisi in Rhode Island uh, found this website. Uh, and OTT uh, is an industry term in the ad industry for streaming services um, like Disney Plus or, or uh, Discovery Plus. Uh, and so that is something that literally no one outside the ad, ad industry uh, understands. So clearly this was not a page meant to sort of, as was discussed earlier, you know, provide a, a biographical sketch of the candidate. Um, there was a biographical sketch tab on the website under Meet Nelly. This was clearly an attempt uh, to uh, signal to a super PAC that uh, here is the information, here are the platforms we want you uh, to put this information on. So yeah, this is, I think, a great timely example. That's a non-federal example. Um, uh, so Sarav works in the federal realm. This was uh, subject to Rhode Island campaign finance law. Excellent. Thank, thanks, John. I, I think that's a really great point to, to highlight here. What we're what we're talking about is you know, red boxing, but this is something that does happen at all levels. Uh, and there are going to be campaign finance rules that apply for federal races that are going to be different for you know state and local races. And so we can be clear about you know uh, you know there's going to be lots of different places or elections that are going to have different rules, uh, but what we're talking about is the same problem. We're talking about coordination between outside spenders and candidates in those elections. Uh, but I wanna to turn to Jordana uh, because I wanna hear more about uh, why we should, why, why should why should a voter care about this? We're talking about candidates, we're talking about big money. Uh, why do voters, why does a, a voter in, in Philadelphia care about red boxing? Thanks, Aaron, and uh, thank you CLC for having me here. And, you know, I, I think as a Philadelphia voter, an important reason to care about this is because in contrast to the state of Pennsylvania, the city, um, along with the city of Pittsburgh, have enacted campaign finance contribution limits, much like federal contribution limits. Um, and those are really a key way of kind of leveling the playing field. Um, among different candidates and making sure that, um, you know, candidates are able to be part of the process. Um, and by circumventing those campaign finance limits in red boxing or any other means of coordination, um, that really undermines the system that's set up to create some level of fairness in the election process, to create some level of transparency in the election process. Um, we also have significant campaign finance reporting requirements, um, but those requirements don't necessarily apply to the same level of detail to a super PAC. Um, and if they are making expenditures to influence a city election, um, they are required to make some filings, but not to the same degree as if they were an active political committee making direct contributions. Um, so I think it really it changes the level of information that the public has available, that the media has access to about how elections are being influenced. And it also really um, undermines the, the limits themselves when coordination is happening um, illegally, whether it's through red boxing or any, any other means. Awesome. Thank you. So if I hear what you're saying, right, it's sort of like we have these contribution limits in place. They're there to prevent corruption, right, between, you know, a donor, like there might be a big donor uh, who wants mm -hmm. to just hand money directly to uh, a candidate. Uh, but in this case, what we're talking about is an outside spender who is spending tons of money coordinating that spending with the candidate just without talking to them directly. Uh, and that should that really should be considered kind of like the same as handing them a check directly, right? Is that? Exactly, right? exactly. It's really, it is just a way, it's another way, and we've seen a number of different ways and and our, you know, our law is sort of adapted as we'll talk about to try and address specific types of coordination. Um, but this is really very much a backdoor way mm -hmm. um, for a candidate to accomplish something they couldn't otherwise, which is having an unlimited pool of money 
available through a super PAC um, and having direct influence over how that money gets spent, which is exactly what is not supposed to happen under the campaign finance laws. Um, so yeah, that that really um, that really creates a situation where we don't we can't trace the money in the same way and we can't see who's influencing our elections and it, it encourages and gives an opportunity for these organizations who hold all of this unlimited money to influence city policy um, and city law and city government, um, particularly in a strong mayor city, the way that we have set up um, in a way that really, um, you know, is really against the entire way that our home rule charter city is supposed to function. Uh, I mean, you may know that Philadelphia has a long and colored his colorful history of um, interesting corruption stories um, and that there was a big shift in city government in the 50s. And, and this is sort of an outgrowth of that continuing effort to really rein in pay to play to um, create a more equitable um, system for electing our officials and influencing them. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I do want to sort of turn back to or kind of open it up a little bit to talk about the effects of this in terms of, you know, what do we see happening when someone like we've we've kind of covered how a candidate operates here, right? Putting information on a website uh, or, or in some other place. Um, what is the effect? Do we see ads coming out of this? Uh, how do we see PACs actually responding to it? Um, and if we you know, if anybody has examples, jump in. I'll, I'll turn to John first if he has a specific example, uh, and then we can make it around. Yeah, thanks, Ken. So uh, in Rhode Island, as I mentioned, uh, we saw this in the Democratic primary for governor uh, last year. And it was really uh, functionally, it was a five-way race, but there were three um, leading candidates. Um, there was the incumbent governor, Dan McKee, uh, the Secretary of State, Nellie Gorbea, who we uh, talked about earlier, uh, and then a self-funder, um, a woman named Helena Folks. Um, Folks was uh, spending, she spent more than $4 million of her own funds, which in a state the size of Rhode Island is a tremendous amount of money. Um, that was a record, I believe, um, for a self-funder in the state's history. And so McKee, uh, even though he was an incumbent governor, was at a, as a financial disadvantage, as was uh, Gorbea. And it's worth mentioning, McKee did some red boxing uh, himself. Um, he had a page on his website that was not, um, could not be found from the homepage. It was buried. You had to go to the site map uh, to find it. Uh, and it contained um, a lighter version of some of the key uh, signaling um, messaging. Uh, and it appears that some of that messaging was used by an outside group, uh, it happened to be a local group um, that was funded by the uh, local laborers union uh, called Forward RI. But in the Gorbea case, um, her red boxing, and if you could have seen the rest of the page, it was quite extensive. They actually had a link to a Dropbox uh, where you could download uh, the raw video um, to, to be used in the ads. That was picked up um, within a couple of weeks, um, right before the primary, uh, by a national group uh, called the Latino Victory Fund, uh, which has a, a, a series of coordinated um, groups, associated groups, I should say, uh, um, and backs Hispanic candidates uh, throughout the United States. They came in, they dropped uh, an ad buy of $118,000, which again is a significant outside buy in the state of Rhode Island. Um, that, that buys you quite a bit of airtime. Uh, and they used um, some of the video uh, that was uh, in the Dropbox and they used um, you know, the, the messaging that was uh, in the red box. And so immediately um, you know, there, there were complaints filed, but it, it, there was a very, very real impact. Um, in fact, the news story that first ran uncovering the red box predicted that that would be the one of the two groups that would come in and use it because they had endorsed her candidacy earlier and they had been aggressively running uh, outside ads uh, in other jurisdictions. So so it was, you know, sort of the whole 
not only did we see the red box, but we kind of saw the whole play uh, that was happening unfold just as predicted uh, in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, you know, and one last point, which is, you know, we're a small state, um, about a million people. Uh, it doesn't take a, a lot of money to influence our elections out here. Our campaign finance direct contribution limits are only $1,000. So, you know, the ability to come in and, and buy $100,000 worth of ads in the last week of a campaign, although ultimately didn't help her win, uh, is really significant. And, and I'm sure the $118,000, uh, you know, that's much larger than the contribution limit in Rhode Island, right? Yeah, yeah. So our contribution limit is $1,000. Uh, and so, um, yeah, mm -hmm. obviously everybody can do the math. It's, it's more than a hundred times. Pretty significant. Um, maybe I'll turn to Sarav if you have, or Georgiana, if you want to jump in. Uh, I, I was going to add that, you know, we, we talked about super PACs in Pennsylvania. One of the other concerns that I have is that I, while super PACs, PACs may be the most sophisticated at knowing where to look for red bossing and knowing how to respond to it, Pennsylvania law prohibits corporate contributions directly to candidates. So it, there's a lot of corporate PACs that exist to be able to engage in spending um, to support or oppose candidates. Um, and then there also is the concern of the of organizations, whether for or nonprofit themselves, picking up on that and taking action as what might otherwise appear to be an independent expenditure um, like a 501c4 could do something like that and that would be really concerning not just under our contribution limits but as to the question of whether it was in fact a legal expenditure in the first place under state election law um, so we have kind of two layers we're working in right i'll, I'll echo that at the federal level it's something similar mm -hmm. Uh, because contributions by corporations are to, to candidates directly are prohibited. Uh, and so that was basically the entire idea behind super PACs, right? They are these uh, super PAC, for those who don't know, is, is kind of a, uh, a street term, a, a common parlance kind of referral, but they're technically called independent expenditure only committees. And the idea is that since Citizens United made it legal for corporations to make unlimited independent expenditures, uh, that these independent expenditure only groups were formed uh, to facilitate that and to pool large amounts of, of money. Uh, but it's the independence that we're really talking about here, whether that independence is real or just kind of a, a, a sham. And I think red boxing is the perfect example of a tactic that has developed over time uh, and, and really, I think, has grown because it hasn't been uh, opposed by regulators at, at the federal level and uh, for the most part across state and local as well, um, that it's it's become a way for that independence to become uh, a, a, an illusion. Awesome. Thanks for that, all that context. It's really helpful to kind of get a sense of what's going on, you know, on the ground in the different environments. Uh, but we can do what well, the exciting thing we can do today is actually turn to a solution, which, uh, you know, at, at CLC, we're, we're all about solutions. Uh, and that's what we're oriented towards. Uh, and we were excited in the summer to see that Philadelphia was actually pursuing a new uh, campaign finance regulation that would address red boxing. Uh, and I was hoping, Jordan, if you would kind of walk us through that process. Sure, Aaron. Yes, it was a um, it's an exciting process. We had um, in I believe June of 2022, uh, council approved amendments to the city's campaign finance law, um, and that meant that we were going to have to take a look at our regulation issued by the Board of Ethics um, in order to update it. And one of the things that came up, while it wasn't specifically called out in the legislative changes. One of the things that came up um, while we were looking at the regulation and making sort of consistency updates and, you know, making sure that it was reflecting the current law, the other, we were really looking at areas where we could improve the specificity of what types of behavior was prohibited. 
um, and in particular in coordination. And Philadelphia, since our laws first went into effect in, I believe, 2012, and then a regulation in 2013, um, we sort of progressively looked at ways to make the coordination provisions of the regulation more comprehensive and to make them responsive to what is happening in elections elsewhere. We have, you know, the, I guess the benefit of having our city elections in off years. So we are currently going into an extremely, already in, an extremely busy um, mayoral and council and city commissioner election cycle. Um, and we have a the insane number of candidates. I think we're close to 100 candidates uh, across the board. Um, and all of those candidates are subject to contribution limits. Some have already doubled because of self-funding. We have a, a, a doubling rule that comes into play. And we were looking at information coming out in the news from other jurisdictions suggesting that this issue about red boxing was going to be a tactic that campaigns and their consultants and the PACs we're really going to be looking to because we had kind of whittled down the options. We had already addressed um, sort of the B-roll footage kind of issue that John referred to um, as being used in conjunction with the red boxing where a uh, campaign puts out uh, sort of the, the footage of them kissing babies and shaking hands and, and otherwise appearing in the community and makes it available just for fun. Um, and in reality, it's getting picked up and used in ads that are paid for by PACs that are supposed to be operating as independent expenditure outfits. Um, so it sort of was a natural progression for us to address this rule. Um, you know, we're lucky that our regulatory process um, for the Board of Ethics is fairly streamlined as compared to um, the federal process and, and I presume as to many states' regulatory pro processes. Um, so we were able to propose um, you know, some changes, have a hearing um, and hear from uh, hear from Aaron, you know you were you were able to be there and give us CLC's perspective, um, heard from some folks you know discussing potential, First Amendment issues, and then also from the attorneys who are active in our jurisdiction um, about what their, you know, what their feedback was on it, and then to respond to that um, before we put the regulation into place. Um, and really, it was an effort not to change our rules, um, but to spell out an additional type of behavior that if it met the criteria you know, outlined in the in the regulation would constitute coordination. Um, you know, put campaigns and candidates on notice before our election cycle really got into full swing that this was going to be considered coordination. Um, I think, you know, looking at and I saw even another article this morning from one of our Inquirer political writers. Um, it was fully expected that there was going to be far more PAC spending, especially in the mayoral election than there would be candidate spending, even though our city um, campaign finance limits are quite a bit higher than what um, Rhode Island has imposed. Um, it's still, and even with the doubling, um, the most of the spending is coming from PACs. Um, and it really is important that we know whether that's truly happening independently, whether those are proper expenditures um, or whether it is, you know, an illegal coordinated expenditure that's prohibited by state law and that violates the um, campaign finance contribution limits. So it really, this was just another way to deal with that before it became a problem in Philadelphia. Um, I, I've heard from some folks who said they saw some things in the um, federal election in 2022 that looked like red boxing, but we haven't actually seen it and we hope to not see it. Um, in our 2023 election. That's excellent. You know, it's great to see, you know, an agency sort of taking advantage of the resources it has to be able to, to actually prevent, you know, the kind of corruption uh, or corruptive, you know, activities that we see in elections uh, and having that kind of flexibility or being able to react to what's going on across the country is is really important. Uh, I, on that note, I would love to hear, you know, kind of turn to Sarab uh, to kind of give the federal side of that story. 
um, and how the FEC is dealing or, or in this case, perhaps not dealing with uh, red boxing. Sure, thanks, Aaron. The, the situation at the FEC is uh, somewhat bleak on this issue. Uh, I'll, I'll start off by setting expectations low. Uh, and the, the reason is that, you know, the federal regulations that deal with coordination uh, are, are very rarely enforced. It's very difficult uh, to get the FEC to believe that anything is coordinated. And in particular, um, what, what is impacting the ability to, re to regulate red boxing is the fact that the regulations contain a sort of general caveat for it, exactly what red boxing is, which is something happening out in the open. So it's, it's prohibited, at least on paper, for a candidate to you know, provide a request or suggestion or to be involved in some material way with an outside spender in, in putting together an ad. Um, so one could read that as already covering what red boxing essentially is. But what the commission has interpreted over time is that if it's publicly available information, then it's not coordination. It's, it's not the kind of conduct that uh, can support a finding of coordination. And so as, as I started off this whole discussion by saying, red boxing is by definition out in the open. Uh, and over time, the FEC has really doubled down on this idea that as long as it's being uh, information that you can find out in the public on a candidate's website or in a tweet, uh, whatever, you know, we don't know which action is doing, but as long as it's happening in a public available forum, the FEC has uh, essentially, they're, they're, they're be uh, and I think that has really uh, I, I think it's made people more creative and ambitious in terms of how blatant they are about putting their requests or suggestions uh, you know they're they're basically instructions but uh, uh, they're they're often framed as it would be great if you know voters heard more about this. Uh, but these are really, you know, as as John uh, said earlier, the, they often use terms that are opaque to the average person that are designed for ad makers. They use obviously phrasing that isn't meant to convey any kind of campaign message. Uh, so I, I think that's exactly the kind of message that although it is out in the open, it is in fact designed for a specific purpose and for a specific audience. Uh, and I think that as I said before, really undermines any notion that these uh, quote unquote independent group spending is actually independent. Excellent. Thanks for thanks for bringing that in. It really does kind of help show the contrast between you know regulating at the city level versus regulating you know, at the state level and the federal level. Uh, it's all kind of different, and everyone at this point is kind of taking a different view of it, uh, and you know kind of. On that note, thinking about different views, I would love to hear uh, more about the views from the folks who are watching. Uh, I think it's a good time to turn to questions from the audience uh, if we have some, and we can uh, get those up on the screen and we'll start going through them. Uh, we have the first question here uh, in, uh, from, from Gabe Sutherland 2. Uh, how should we think about red boxing by the national parties through sponsored websites? Versus by, versus by individual campaigns. And so I'll, maybe I'll start with uh, Sarav on this one, kind of to describe what this is and, and your initial thoughts on it. Sure, I mean, at one level, I wouldn't say it's that different because uh, outside spending groups aren't allowed to coordinate with parties uh, any more than they are allowed to coordinate with Cam, individual candidates' campaigns. Uh, so a, a website or, um, and, and, and I think it's good to think about it broadly too. It's websites today, uh, but it, it could be another way of conveying those instructions in the future. Uh, websites just happens to be what people are using today. Uh, but yeah, parties using a website or other means to publicly convey their 
uh, requests or instructions for uh, super PACs or other outside groups to run ads, uh, that's also just as problematic. I mean, the the whole notion of uh, independence of these outside groups is just as much undermined if it's it's a party that's organizing, you know, kind of the the messages that they want conveyed. Which I think you you might see a lot more when you're talking about uh, a situation of a uh, state race or, or even a congressional race that is particularly com com contested. Uh, there were certainly some Senate races in the last election cycle that had a ton of national money, including money from the parties, uh, pouring in. And unsurprisingly, they also had a ton of super PAC money poured in. Uh, and yet, if, if that spending were independent, that'd be one thing. But I think if it's coordinated, that, that corruption potential is even even higher. Yeah, Excellent. I was going to say, I, I think I don't disagree, Sarah, with your, you know, with your read on it. I will say that the way that our VRAG was designed was really targeted at campaigns coordinating with PACs, although could certainly see a situation where we see a party organization uh, whether it's national or whether it's the city committee um, doing some red boxing and it, we would be then I think that our enforcement team would probably be looking for something like evidence that the campaign is actually behind that effort um, which would not be surprising in that situation um, but this was really really tried to at this early stage really narrowly tailor this around the activities of campaigns since that's where we've seen it so far but it's a great question to think about how how that might still be um, illegal coordination. Yeah, and I think I think that's helpful to to kind of contrast again with the um, well, my light keeps going off here. Sorry for that. Um, one second here, I've got to keep moving to keep the lights on. Um, but the uh, uh, I, I think it's helpful to contrast, particularly when we're talking about this example. Um, I think what. Gabe is referring to here, just to, to give a little detail, is you might see national parties put together like a website, right, where they you can kind of, you know, see all the candidates they're supporting across the country or across, you know, a jurisdiction. Uh, and you, you can pick a map and see exactly what the messages are supposed to be. You can see exactly what uh, the candidate uh, bio is and, and how they want their ads. And it's all condensed there on um, with one website, it's kind of like a one-stop shop for a super PAC if they're really just going to support a party's candidates. Uh, that way they don't have to go spend a lot of time on, you know, 50 different candidates' websites. They can just go to one spot. Uh, and, I, you know, thinking about how that may have started at the, uh, kind of at the federal level, you know, I am curious to see, you know, if we had a crystal ball, uh, what that's going to turn into uh, John, I was curious if you think, you know, you could see practices like that kind of filtering down from the federal level to the state level uh, there in Rhode Island or in other states. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, yeah, in fact, my organization really got involved in this back in 2011, right after Citizens United uh, was decided because we feared as a <clears throat> small state uh, that with a unified media market, right? So we're a fairly cheap media market because the entire state is covered um, in one market. Uh, and, it, you know, it would be relatively cheap for outside spenders to come in uh, and win, a, you know, tip the balance in a U.S. Senate race or in a governor's contest. Uh, and so in 2012, we beefed up our independent expenditure statute, the, the underlying statute, uh, thinking that we needed to be prepared for that and, and our prediction was correct because you know the group that ran this ad was not a that I talked about earlier um, the Latino Victory Fund is it's not a Rhode Island group it is a national group that came in um, and even though we have seen um, some of this happening with local PACs uh, generally it's the more sophisticated national actors who kind of parachute in because they have some particular interest in in the race. Um, and so uh, I just should mention, 
you know, we've been working for, for four years with CLC, um, trying to get some regulations in place uh, around our uh, 2012 law. We, we hope that this is the year we're going to um, get those in place. Um, our administrative uh, rulemaking process is extremely slow uh, in some instances in Rhode Island. Um, we're not the FEC, but we're, we're uh, the, the wheels turn really slow here. But, um, and, and I think this, ex this last race um, really helps the regulator um, realize that, you know, we're not going to be immune from this stuff uh, in Rhode Island and we're going to have to be prepared because this will just happen increasingly, uh, particularly, um, you know, uh, once sophisticated national actors see that they can kind of parachute in and do this. Okay, I think I, I think it should be back again here. Um, thanks for that, John. I appreciate it. Uh, the uh, I think we do have a, another question from the audience for us uh, from Patrick Levine Rose. Uh, won't candidates uh, won't candidate campaigns take redboxing underground to thwart new regulations to limit redboxing? Won't this make the problem worse? After all, candidates can still communicate to PACs after new regulations to block redboxing. For example, by making speeches in small forums that telegraph to PACs how to spend on candidate preferred messages targeted as the campaign wants. And I think what, what Patrick is getting at here is there are gonna be other ways for candidates and, PAC, and super PACs to communicate, uh, but maybe we do wanna kind of address that here. Is that, is that something that's gonna be addressed by redboxing? Are we just sort of uh, you know, playing whack-a-mole um, and maybe maybe we could start with Jordana on this one. Uh, if you want to start here, that'd be great. Yeah, I, and I mean, I have a I have to admit to having a, an old New Yorker cartoon on my office bulletin board, sort of two guys sitting, and this new regulation is going to require us to find entirely new ways to get around it. Um, and there is some of that, and and that's certainly something in every area of life worked in. It's, there is a there's an element of whack-a-mole. However, I think in this particular situation, the whole point of the of restricting red boxing and calling red boxing out from from our perspective in Philadelphia to for calling it out specifically under our coordinated expenditures rule is that typically, as Sarah was saying, typically if the statement's made in public, um, it's not going to be considered coordination. It's just a thing that's out there that anyone can use in any way they want. Um, but by identifying specific indicia of pub otherwise publicly available information that identify it as a actually a direct communication to an intended audience with an intended outcome, um, that it it the whole idea is that it is public um, and anything that is public is not going to be coordination unless it meets X, Y, and Z criteria. So I don't think that this will do anything that the existing rules don't already do in terms of making communications go underground. If people are going to break the rules. They're going to break the rules. If they're going to if they're going to break the rules by having private communications to direct spending of an independent expenditure committee, they're they're just going to do that. This is a question of public information is otherwise an exception, but how are people abusing that? Um, and yes, will they find new ways to try to massage it? I'm, I'm sure we will be back in a couple of years talking about something different, but that doesn't mean that we ignore it, nor do I think it will really truly encourage people who wouldn't otherwise just entirely disregard the rules and have those private conversations um, to do so. Um, that's just, that's my thought on it. Excellent, thanks Jordana. Maybe we can, uh get Saurav to weigh in on this one as well. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. There's always a bit of an arms race. You know, you regulate something, people find new ways to get around that regulation. Uh, the, the game continues. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we sort of uh, disregard what we see happening uh, in, in every election cycle these days, which is 
uh, out in the open specific instructions from campaigns to outside spenders. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to maybe step back and think about, all right, if, if this wasn't happening, what, what could super PACs and other outside spenders legally do? Uh, I, you know, obviously a campaign is allowed to put out ads that, uh, that talk about the candidate and what they stand for and, uh, what they want to do in office. Uh, if super PACs were indeed independently looking at a campaign's ads or, or looking at the messages, uh, they were putting out there and saying, well, let's try and reinforce that. You know, we have a lot more money so we can run a lot more ads. Uh, let's just double down on what the campaign is doing, or let's try and, uh, oppose uh, some of the, you know, their opponents, you know, that there's, there's, that's how the election system is supposed to work. Now we can have a separate argument about the effect of outside groups pouring in all this money anyways. I'm sure, you know, John is right with a state like Rhode Island, a million people to influence uh, all that outside money is going to have a, a massive effect. Um, but living in the world that we are, where these groups exist and, and the Supreme Court says this is all legal, uh, that is, is going to happen and, and that would be fine. What we're talking about here is something a lot more specific uh, that needs to be addressed because even the kind of uh, world in which the Supreme Court has said this should be legal, these outside groups should be uh, under the First Amendment allowed to spend money, uh, they do that independently. Is that independent piece that red boxing has uh, has obliterated? Now, do I do I think red boxing regulation would drive some of those conversations underground? It's possible, but that's already illegal. Uh, if somebody, if a candidate, you know, sets up a private channel to talk to a super PAC, uh, that's illegal. If they, you know, let a super PAC know that you know we're going to be making a speech at such and such venue and at the very end of that, so we're going to be really key instructions for the ads. I'd say that's already illegal. Uh, so this is about addressing the thing that isn't currently illegal, but is in fact uh, a very blatant type of coordination. Excellent. Thank you. I think uh, we have done a great job in running uh, right up to the end of our hour here. And I'd like to give an opportunity just for our panelists to leave us with any last thoughts that they have. Uh, for our discussion today, for our audience today, uh, as we've been thinking about red boxing, and maybe what we'll do is we'll start at the uh, we'll start at the state level and go from there. Uh, if we want to start with John, sure. So yeah, thank you again to uh, CLC for um, bringing us together today, and uh, for Jordana to join us with the municipal perspective. Um, yeah, this is incredibly important, I think, uh, for our democracy because it's undermining um, uh, what we are trying to do in, in uh, terms of uh, creating a more inclusive democracy. And, and this, you know, there was a lot of talk a decade ago about Citizens United, and it seems to have kind of faded um, from the headlines uh, in the last few years. But this, you know, there is a through line to what the Supreme Court did to how these actors are behaving now. And uh, a lot of uh, folks condemned the decision at the time uh, and now are sort of engaged in practices uh, that, um, you know, align with, you know, uh, the post-Citizens United world. And I think we have to kind of continue to try to hold the wall uh, and try to um, do the best we can with the tools we have uh, to deal with uh, the, the post Citizens United world uh, and red boxing is just the most one of the most obvious um, consequences that we we have to deal with. No one um, in my experience uh, when we saw it happen in uh, my state, you know, nobody was happy about it. Um, people were outraged. It became a campaign issue, um, and now it's for the regulators to deal with. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think it's important that we have organizations like CLC, my organization, uh, the Board of Ethics in, in Philadelphia, trying to pursue this because ultimately it's gonna erode our democracy if we don't. Excellent, thanks, John. Uh, and maybe we can turn to Saurav next. 
Sure. Uh, you know, I think I've given kind of a general overview of why this matters and uh, what effect it has. Uh, and I will say that I think, just, just to add to that, it's one of those problems that if regulators don't address uh, is only, I think is only going to grow in scope because at the end of the day, regulations like uh, those defining and prohibiting coordination need to be enforced. We need to actually be serious when we say these groups need to be independent in their spending or otherwise they just get more and more brazen. Um, and I think at, at some level, it's almost a little unfair to, to expect, you know, that candidates are simply going to not, not do what they see others doing and, and, you know, getting an unfair advantage. Uh, just as a fun anecdote, one of my favorite red boxes of all time uh, was from, from this past election cycle, and it was John Fetterman's. Uh, his, his website had a page that was clearly intended for, for media, for, for the super PACs, but it started off by saying, this page only exists because our campaign finance system is broken. Uh, and then it proceeded to, to do what red boxes do. Uh, but I, I found that really amusing, but also insightful that that sort of cheeky pointing out that like, I, 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 I would love to not have to do this. I would love for uh, us to not have to engage in this kind of behavior, uh, but it's not being regulated and everyone's doing it. And I'm not going to be the only one out here without, uh, without some help. Uh, especially as, as most people know, the Pennsylvania Senate race was hotly contested and with a lot of uh, outside money pouring in. Uh, so I, I think it really is incumbent on our regulators to look at this as a problem. If we're stuck living with Citizens United and super PACs and, and massive amounts of special interest spending, uh, let's at least hold candidates and outside groups to uh, the very broad parameters that the Supreme Court uh, prescribed, which is, as, as I've been saying, that this spending at least needs to be independent uh, and, 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 and not uh, see that independence just uh, openly circumvented in every single election. That's really key. Excellent. Thanks, Saurabh. And I think we'll save the last comment for uh, the one among us who is actually you know, done something about red boxing in terms of, you know, taking official action and what we're seeing in Philadelphia. Thanks. Yes. I mean, we're our sincere hope and we only regulate candidates for city elective office. So we, you know, we don't get to impact the statewide um, judicial or, or gubernatorial other elections. Um, but it is our hope that in our corner of the state um, that we are it, we're, you know, effective in getting out ahead of this um, and in preventing and, you know, cutting off an avenue um, that really creates an imbalance. Um, you know, you may know that Philly uh, tends to be a little protective um, and, you know, the concerns about outside money, about unfair competition, um, you know, are very, very real and palpable. Um, and while, you know, candidates certainly want to to, and I think the reality is that candidates will take advantage of any tactic that they see working unless we specifically say it's illegal. Um, and that we had the opportunity to do that. Um, we're very lucky that it, it came up in the timing that it did. So our hope is that we do not have to even worry about this in the coming elections um, over the next several years. Um, and that we'll be looking at, you know, whatever the next best thing is that people come up with. But um, you know, it's important to us, as Sarah said, to, to really, we don't have a perfect election system. Um, there are certainly other things that, you know, that I would like to see that I think board members would like to see and that I think voters in the city would like to see. Um, but within the system we have, we need to continue to make the efforts to um, keep the, uh, keep independent expenditures independent. And they, you know, those folks are entitled to the free speech rights that the Supreme Court, you know, gave to them under that case, and we can't do anything about that. Um, but we we can do is make sure that their speech is their own and that they're taking the effort to find something to say 
and not simply um, taking what the candidate has asked them to say and saying that. Um, and that's, I think, is a, a more appropriate way of them engaging in speech through campaign spending. Excellent. Yeah, we'll be looking forward to seeing uh, how how Philadelphia does and how that how that carries forward. Because you know, we when we saw when we saw it at CLC, you know, we saw it as kind of a model for getting started on addressing uh, red boxing, right? Not just at the municipal level, but it could be a model for the state level for the federal level, making sure that it's clear someone's doing something about this, uh, making sure that, you know, outside special interests aren't just bankrolling entire candidate campaigns uh, through this red boxing and basically getting around our important campaign finance rules. Um, I'm really uh, thrilled that we got to have this conversation today, and I'm going to start turning it towards uh, closing it up. Uh, so I do want to thank all of our panelists for being here. Uh, John Marion from Common Cause Rhode Island, Jordana Greenwald from the Philadelphia Board of Ethics, and Saurabh Ghosh from here at Campaign Legal Center. Uh, the uh, one one thing I do want I do want to make a couple pitches here um, for coordination in particular. If you want to learn more about coordination problems and solutions to these coordination problems in our campaigns, you can go to campaignlegal.org. Uh, and you can check out our Democracy U page. Uh, we provide kind of an educational page to give information about what coordination is and how, what we can do to address it. Uh, and and we can, you know, we're adding, eventually we'll be adding red box into that as kind of a, you know, something that needs to be addressed. Uh, and we can also see that, you know, if you want to check out Philadelphia's rules, uh, you can go to the Philadelphia Board of Ethics website uh, and, and they'll have a regulation there that they can that you can look through just to see exactly what they did uh, to put their rule in place. And then finally, uh, you know, you can actually see coordination rules in Rhode Island as well. Those don't yet address red boxing explicitly, uh, but Rhode Island does have uh, you know, relatively comprehensive uh, coordination rules, like John was mentioning, uh, things that he's worked on specifically. And you can do that by checking out their statutes. Uh, you can see their statutes online, uh, and I can I can give you the site right now if you want. The statute is uh, Chapter Seventeen or Title Seventeen, Chapter Twenty Five, Section Twenty Three, uh, and you can you can go there, and that'll get you started on searching out uh, Rhode Island's coordination laws. Um, just flipping back to uh, Philadelphia for a second. Uh, the board regulation is regulation one. So if you're looking for uh, the anti-coordination rules, look for uh, regulation one. With all of that in mind, I do wanna thank our panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you do have further questions or would like more information, feel free to email us at info at campaignlegal.org or campaignlegalcenter.org. And then thank you again and have a great afternoon.